and welcome to another episode of Haga Plays. That the Nintendo 64 is my all-time favorite console should come as a surprise to no one, with classics like Mario 64, Ocarina of Time, Perfect Dark, and Star Fox 64, the console still gets quite a bit of my attention, but beyond the well-recognized classics, there are lots of games that are worth picking up. But this isn't going to be a top list of the runners-up, no, this is a list of games that I think you should pick up for other reasons. Some for their unique atmosphere, others because they're technically interesting, and others just because they were awful on release, but for whatever reason, can be seen in a different light nowadays. This is my top 5 of Left Field Classics. Automobile Lamborghini has a special significance to me. You see, when I was considering to get a new console in the mid-90s, I based my decision entirely on booklets I got from the local toy store. I got one showing games for the PlayStation, one for the Nintendo 64, and since the Sega Saturn was a big flop, there was no booklet, and I wasn't even aware that it existed. I don't remember off the top of my head what games were in these booklets, except for two games, the two that made me make up my mind. One was Goldeneye and the other was Automobile Lamborghini. As childish as it may seem, those games made me pick the Nintendo 64, firstly because they both really look photorealistic in those tiny screenshots, and second because as a 10 year old I obsessed over two things, James Bond and the Lamborghini Diablo. But here's the hook. While GoldenEye was the very first game I got for the system, I didn't actually pick up Lamborghini until about two years ago. A few things hit me right off the bat. First off is actually the game's title, Automobile Lamborghini. It features a Lamborghini on the box art, on the cartridge label, and when you boot the game up, you are given a choice between a Lamborghini Countach and a Lamborghini Diablo. But once you enter your first race, you see that your competition is driving Ferraris, Porsches and McLarens. And yes, you can unlock all of these cars. So rather than just being an homage to the history of the Lamborghini brand, as you might think, this is more like an N64 equivalent of Need for Speed 2. First impressions can, however, be deceptive as I very quickly found some considerable flaws in the gameplay. You see, this is a game from that transitional period where players both compete to reach first place and have a limited amount of time to get to the next checkpoint. In games like Ridge Racer 64, this isn't really a problem. However, in this game it is. In Lamborghini, you can be in first place and still run out of time. Even the novice arcade mode is hard as nails for this exact reason. What's even worse, however, is the vehicle handling. The game features two difficulty settings, which strangely seem to solely impact vehicle physics. Set it to novice, and the car seemed glued to the track. Set it to expert, and you can't enter any turns without bending out. Put all this together, and you have a quite unenjoyable racing game on your hand. But wait, isn't this supposed to be a top 5 video? Why the hell am I spending all this time relentlessly bashing a poor old racing game? Well, after the game released, Titus went back to work, and yeah, by the way, this game is made by Titus. Yeah, that Titus. Unlike its predecessor, Roadsters isn't an N64 exclusive. It came out on the PlayStation and Dreamcast, but those versions came out later and were very different and not very well received. That's not strange at all, as unlike the N64, those two systems had much better racing games for them. Let me make that clear. What I'm showing you isn't better than the first Gran Turismo games, Metropolis Street Racer, uh, Sega GT, and most certainly not my personal favorite of the time, Need for Speed Road Challenge. But it is the closest thing to those games on this system. You see, Titus didn't just take the last game fix the biggest flaws and churn out a sequel. They went back to the drawing board and pretty much redid everything. The game now features a true single player campaign, seemingly inspired by Gran Turismo. You earn in-game cash for winning races, which you spend on buying and upgrading cars. Mind you, while the upgrades are much more limited than Gran Turismo, 
the handling is still far superior to Lamborghini. Gone are the two completely different and equally flawed handling modes. Instead, they've been replaced with fun and accessible vehicle handling. Between the games, the developers must have learned a whole lot about the hardware because the visual difference is tremendous. Textures are more varied, colorful and high res. There's considerably more detail in the surroundings, right down to birds flying. And of course, the cars look way better, featuring more detail and shiny reflections. And if you have an expansion pack, you can type in a cheat code to increase resolution. Unfortunately, I can't show you this, as the particular resolution that the game upscales to makes my capture card go kinda nuts. If you're a car nut like me, you'll love the massive selection of cars in this game. The game contains about 40 reality-based cars, which include everything from the Toyota MR2 to the Jaguar E-Type and Lamborghini Diablo. Sort of. You see, some brands like Toyota, Alfa Romeo, Fiat and Renault are fully licensed, but other cars that are included in the game are, are under fake brand names. Like I said before, these are among the best looking cars on the console, and the handling really differs from car to car. The only complaint I can come up with is that they could have sounded kinda better. In the later part of the 32-64-bit generation, Acclaim got hold of the rights to make games based on South Park. The result of this deal was three games. An FPS known just as South Park, a Mario Kart clone known as South Park Rally, and this, South Park Chef's Love Shack. The premise is incredibly simple. In fact, I'm going to allow the game to explain on its own. South Park Cable Access welcomes you to Chef's Love Shack, the sexiest, sultriest, most sensual game show on earth. The show where young, vivacious, uninhibited swimsuit models compete for the chance to spend a romantic weekend with our host. Due to the lack of young, vivacious, uninhibited swimsuit models, today's show will feature youngsters from South Park Elementary. And now, won't you give it up for your host, the most eligible, edible, and ultimately unforgettable, Chef. Long story short, South Park Chef's Love Shack is a trivia game where you and up to three friends get to answer a selection of the 200 questions that are included in the game. The questions cover everything from history to biology to music and, of course, South Park. The game had a very poor reception on launch, in part because of the limited amount of questions which limited the game's replayability, but also because of the lacking amount of content. Let me just show you everything that happens from the start screen until the start of the game. Need your help. Okay, how many contestants will be playing today? Going solo, huh? Pick me, pick me! Time to kill it! Kill it! How many rounds are we playing today? Just a quickie then. Notice anything? That's right, this game has no options or menus whatsoever. It's literally start the game, select a character, select how many players, select how many turns you want to play, and you're off. There's no options menu where you can configure sound, controls, or languages. There aren't any alternate game modes, no possibility to play minigames only, or disable certain categories of questions. As I told you before, the game has 200 questions covering all manner of things. Well. These questions seem to cover too many different subjects, to the point that most people I've played with rarely get any of the answers right. To a much too large extent, winning is a matter of who gets the most reasonable questions, unless someone's been playing the game over and over and memorized the questions. Yet again, I hear you saying, why am I talking about something so awful? Did a claim go back to the drawing board and release an improved spiritual successor a few years later? No, at least not as far as I know of. Instead, it's a matter of time passing. You see, had it still been the year 2000 and the game had been sold at full price or even half price, I would have told you to steer clear and 
I would have bemoaned that I ever bought this abomination. But I didn't buy it at full price. I bought it about a year ago for 25 krona at game on the day I record this. That translates to $2.70 or €2.60. That's as much as a bottle of beer or a bag of potato chips. And for that amount of money, it's the perfect party game. The absurdity of the questions will make your friends laugh, regardless of if they've answered right or not. And so what if the questions won't last you that long? For the amount of money, it only really needs to entertain your friends for 20 or 30 minutes, which it does no problem at all. In fact, I bring it out every time I throw a party nowadays, and each time people want to play it. Let's make that clear. The game's strong point isn't finesse or longevity. What is, however, is accessible fun. The simple gameplay, which only uses the D-pad and two buttons, is easier and even more accessible than Mario Party. I'd call this game an electronic equivalent to, depending on how old you are, either spin the bottle or beer pot. It's the kind of game that's not just fun to play, but also fun for a drunk crowd to gather around and look at. The mini games are actually really good. They range from completely original ideas to South Park themed homages to arcade classics like Paperboy, Asteroids and Donkey Kong. So basically, if you're a party person and have an N64, this is a game I can highly recommend for you.